All right. So uh, welcome everyone to the Chorus Forum, New Connections of Research Data to Content. Um, I'm Howard Ratner and I'm the Executive Director of Chorus. This forum represents a continuing stream of new and exciting steps forward for Chorus. We've long been recognized for our work supporting open access data and tra transparency. Today, we continue that effort by expanding on a series of important discussions among key participants in the OE landscape around data and software. We're delighted to have such a diverse audience joining us. And we have over 200 registrants that we have today and they'll, we're gonna see them um, join more and more with almost equal numbers coming from funders, institutions and publishers. So this event will occur from 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. U.S. Eastern time. Event operations are gonna be run by Tara Packer, our chorus program manager. And we appreciate greatly that many of you in other time zones have stayed up late to participate or are watching the recording. So on to the agenda. We have a wonderful lineup, including two excellent sessions. So session one includes four speakers covering data citations and sharing. And that's going to be having Shelley Stahl of AGU. We'll do the moderation. And then after that, we're gonna take a 10 minute break from 12 to 12.10. I'm gonna to try to keep close to that. And in session two, I'll join you again, but this time as a moderator. And we're thrilled to have five speakers discussing the challenges and progress with data as a key asset for funders in academia. Before moving on, I wanna mention a few housekeeping items. We're recording this event for those who could not attend live, and we'll be making that recording available publicly afterwards. All attendees are in lesson only mode. We've asked our speakers and moderators to turn their microphones and cameras only on at the appropriate time. And we will have time for questions at the end of each session. So please type your questions into the QA box in Zoom. And you can access this by clicking in the QA icon on the bottom of your screen. If you see a question that you feel is important, you can upvote it by clicking on the thumbs up icon to the left, just below the question. And that will raise the question towards the top of the queue. Staff will then read out the questions to the speakers. We will try to include as many as possible, but cannot guarantee that we're gonna get them all. We'll also be conducting a very short poll at the end of the forum. And you can find the link to the poll in the chat window. We would appreciate your completing the poll by the end of the forum. Of course, I have to thank our many sponsors whose generous contributions have made today's event possible. At the platinum level, we have ACM, at the gold is ACS, AIPP, the American Meteorological Society, Geoscience World, and IEEE. And on the silver level is IOPP, SAGE, and Silverchair. So please enjoy today's event. And without further ado, I will pass the baton over to Shelley. Thanks, Howard. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, there's a lot going on in our space and our speakers will have an opportunity to share that. So let's get started. Um, Rachel Lammy's up first and she is the head of special programs at Crossref. If you wanna learn more about her in the program online, you can access the rest of her bio. Uh, but Rachel, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Perfect. Okay, can you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Um, so said I, wanted to um, just to take 10 minutes to talk a bit about Crossref support for, um, for research data. It said as head of special programs working with, um, with publishers and other external um, initiatives on, um, on the sharing of um, and citation of research data is, is one of the, the aspects of my role. Next. So um, I'm going to borrow from a, a book written um, in a book sprint on open data metrics um, with a cross section of um, contributors. But what I wanted to show is that the it's good that we've got such a you know such a broad set of presenters today because the framework for data usage and citation just highlights the roles that um, that the different different players occupy and also that the directions that citations to and from data need to flow so that this information can be collected and used um, consistency consistently. So I've kind of zo zoomed in on the aspects around um, collecting it and where Crossref and data sites um, can play a part in the exchange of that open information as well. Next. So a top level view from the um, from the Crossref side is that publishers 
regularly pass metadata and identifiers to us when they're registering DOIs upon publication um, upon publication of a work. Yes, journal articles, but then also things like um, preprints, book chapters, um, and different content types. And it's very simplest, um, citations to data should be added to the, the information or the metadata that publishers register with us. And because we're identifier people using identifiers for the, for the data when they're available. Um, and the thing that actually Shelley and I have been talking about is that certainly at the on the publisher side, I think the work starts at the policy level. So deciding that you're going to collect citations to data as standard and making that information populate through publication workflows so that it ends up with Crossref and then we can we can pick up the um, the dissemination of that information in a standard and and open way. And I appreciate that obviously as well that starts with the um, researchers familiarity with data citation and sharing practices as well. Um, but just making sure that if that information is there, then it, it gets to, um, it gets to um, people who are interested in tracking, using and sharing that information. Next. So I wanted to pull out a very, um, a very um, specific example. So I've got a, um, a rapid communication from Wiley um, published in the Paleontology Journal. It has a data archiving statement available with that paper. And then in the metadata, which I've called out, um, there's a citation to the data that underlies the paper um, in the Dryad um, repository with the DOI of that, of that paper, which is lovely. Next slide. So what we can do with that is we can make that information available via Crossref's APIs and via our event data service, which takes a subset of that information. So in this case, um, links um, between, um, between Crossref and data site DOIs that we can see, and it makes those openly available. And it said data site themselves use that information in data site search, which is the, the second um, image that I show here. So you can see that they can then start to see citations to that. Um, they can start to see citations to the data from the from the published literature. And then also um, interesting things like views and, and downloads, which I know that um, that Matt and the team at data site are, are working on a lot. So getting that information, making it openly available, then passes it to for use by search and discovery services or really anyone who's interested. Next slide. So in this case, um, it even it it also goes to the repositories themselves. So looking at the information in Dryad, you can see a link to the um, the related works, the paper itself, the citation use um, usage, and just something is um, something else that I that I looked at in the um, in the data site metadata that Dryad have registered. I can see a link to the license that um, the license for the data itself. So again, as a funder, I can look and see if that complies with my data sharing policy, um, or as as a researcher, I know what they then I can go how I can then go on and use that data. Um, and the nice thing is that data site then pass that information back to Crossref as well. So if they see um, Crossref DOIs being referenced in the data site metadata, then they pass that information back to us. And we also make it available um, via event data and in a, um, in a hub that translates the information into um, Scholix format. Next, please. So, I've shown you, you know, that's a that's kind of a small example, and it's really important that the information is um, is scalable. So what we do in the Crossref side is, once we get metadata from from publishers that includes um, citations to data, either in the bibliography or relationship metadata, um, we take a look: is there a DOI tag with the DOI um, available, or um, potentially other um, other types of identifier? Is there a structure reference that we can, we can see as a data citation? And if so, then we'll add it to the event data service. 
It's available via our APIs anyway. And then we also transform it into um, the Scholix format, which is a, which is a standard um, format um, that, which is a standard format for sharing um, information on citations to data. And that's part of um, work that's been done by the Research Data Alliance. So making it available in a format that isn't unique to data site, isn't unique to Crossref, but can be used by um, other participants in the community. Next, please. Said, um, I think one of the briefs for this was looking at what can potentially go wrong. And you can see in some instances, even though we see DOIs for data being included in, um, in the reference lists and the HTML versions of articles, sometimes that information falls out at points in the workflow. So if we don't, if we don't have the identifiers for the data citations, then we can't make all of those downstream processes happen. Next, please. And we also know that we've got work to do at Crossref to better support um, citations to data. So in the next, um, the next iteration of our schema, we're going to support exp an expanded citation markup. So being able to put um, information specifically about content types into the schema. So in the top example, I can flag a publication type as data, which is something that the, the JATS tag set that a lot of our members use um, already supports. And later in 2021, um, we want to start the collection of data availability statements in our Crossref metadata, again, to, um, to complement the, um, the other information that's being collected and shared by, by the research community. Next, please. So, need to leave time for others. I think that the key messages are that Crossref is invested in data. Um, and we we want to continue to work with publishers to um, to support research data, and that involves participating in other external initiatives um, around around the sharing of this information. So that STM have been running a research data year, and we're also a non funded partner in the Make Data Count initiative, which is around um, open metrics for data, and also to encourage standard practices in terms of data citation. So sending the information to us helps them be collected, distributed in a standard, scalable and machine readable way. And just to play a part in rewarding and recognizing the research um, researchers by valuing other types of outputs. So next, please. So I'll just stop there, um, leave time for other presenters and for any questions. But thanks for the invitation to speak. Thanks so much, Rachel. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, and meanwhile, we will continue with our speakers. Um, Matthew Buys is the Executive Director for Datasite um, and works very closely with Crossref. And I'm excited about what he's about to present. Great, thanks, Shelley. Um, we can jump right into the first slide. Um, really great to be speaking with everyone here today and um, also trying to sort of um, bring something unique also following on from Rachel with a lot of our collaboration, trying not to repeat um, a lot of the collaborative work that we do with Crossref. With Crossref. Um, really fundamentally, just to talk about persistent identifiers, um, but really focusing on that associated metadata are the essential components that we um, as a community um, rely on for the implementation of their principles. And so the next slide, um, uh, next slide, please, sorry. Um, we um, talk a bit about um, how we actually achieve this at Datasite and with our community. Um, we focus on using standardized metadata and connecting these persistent identifiers to make research data uh, findable. Um, we make it accessible, making it resolvable um, worldwide um, through the handle um, system. Um, we make it interoperable using standard vocabularies and links to other persistent identifiers, which I'll talk about in a moment. And we make it reusable. And this is really also an important component um, to what we're talking about today and being able to cite research uh, sources with confidence and making sure that there's credit uh, for the work um, that is being produced in the research outputs. Next slide, please. Um, at Datasite, we uh, find and connect research. Um, and so we bring this together 
in a user interface, which has been launched last year, um, known as Datasite Commons. Um, the backend technology or under the surface is the PID graph. Um, and this is um, built on GraphQL technology. And I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. Next slide, please. So just to introduce the PID graph briefly, um, we continue to work on these existing connections with persistent identifiers in different standardized ways, as I mentioned, um, and making sure that we can link outputs with a particular researcher, repository, institution, funder, to ensure that we can allow for the discovery and impact um, assessment downstream. Um, this allows us to address use cases that um, were more complex and previously we couldn't do um, or achieve. And these connections um, are really described in, in a graph. And this graph in theory is the resources identified by persistent identifiers and they connect to each other. Next slide, please. Research is already a graph as we know. Um, and so um, we can look at various different types of relationships between the entities within the graph and bring that together. Next slide, please. So this is where the PID graph enters. And so having unique persistent identifiers for researchers and their outputs is crucial to connect um, these pieces together and bringing together the entire research landscape. Um, persistent identifiers, and we talk about this often as persistent identifier infrastructure providers, we talk about the blue skies and the potential that this brings. Um, but really bringing this together in a graph allows us to fully realize and take advantage of these connecting powers. And so with the PID graph, we now have the ability to clearly identify relations that are at least two hops away. And so with the persistent identifier, we can, from the metadata, identify A and B. We can say, this individual produced this paper. But what about identifying this individual produced this paper that cited this data set that was funded by this funder? And that's what the power of the PID graph is. Next slide, please. Uh, so what needs to happen, and this is a really, really important piece um, of what we need to do as a community, the technology exists and the technology is available to be used, but it's only useful if we all contribute to the collective open infrastructure. And so it's really important that we as stakeholders in the community, we all have a role in our respective, um, I guess, place in the ecosystem, is that we make and surface the relational um, assertions into the metadata. And so um, identifying citations, identifying references, and um, uh, clarifying the relations between the different identifiers is crucial. Next slide, please. And so when this happens, we can start talking about examples. And so this is in Datacite Commons. As I mentioned, this is the user interface on top of the PID graph. And um, so over here, we can see that this is a data set um, within Datacite Commons. Um, we can see that it's got one citation. We can also see through Make Data Account that it's got 99 views. It's been downloaded 16 times. And then we can start traversing the PID graph and understanding more. So if we go to the next slide, we can now see, okay, well, what was that citation? And we can see that this citation was made by this journal article um, and we can then dig one step further so we can go into that and start next slide please um, looking at the recognition and so we can identify who were the creators who was involved in this we can also look at the different institutions that were involved um, in this research next slide please we can then start to leverage things like orchid ids um, and so um, Shelly, I hope you didn't mind me using your ORCID ID, um, but this is also uh, building on a lot of the work that we've done with Parsec and um, um, Shelly at AGU, is we can start surfacing um, information about individuals and relations to that individual. And over here, we can see different types of outputs, articles, data sets. We can also see the work types, and we can also start seeing surfacing licensing information as well. Next slide, please. Um, this allows us to continue to leverage the citations and usage. And so over here, we can have a look at, and sorry, I think the boxes um, got moved somewhere in the formatting. Um, but here we're looking at a specific uh, uh, grant. So this is looking at a European commission. It's slightly small, um, at least on my screen, but a European commission funded grant. 
and we can then look at the um, citations and the views and, and the impact of that um, research um, project or grant. Next slide, please. So what do we need to do around the metadata? So to improve the reuse and discovery, we need to focus on uh, four things that I'm going to talk about here. The first is rights. So uh, making sure in the metadata that we uh, make the license information available. The second is description. Um, and this may not uh, initially seem particularly critical, but it's really important to provide um, descriptive information about the resource. And particularly when we're talking about um, data sets that as an example, um, COVID-19 may not be a typical controlled vocabulary term. And so it's important to put in this description. Next slide, please. Then we talk about related identifier. And so this one um, may go without saying, but it's really important that um, this is what we use to uh, link resources together. And a lot of what we're talking about in the PID graph is built on the related identifier piece. And then finally, the subject field, and this helps for discovery and easier um, um, visibility of, of research assets. Next slide, please. Um, so really importantly, um, what needs to happen in the community that you need to support data citation. And so if we talk about doing this from a data site perspective, data site members, um, we have over 2,300 repositories across 44 countries that are actively registering DOIs and putting in metadata related to that. And they are focusing on the related identifier to surface those citations. Um, as Rachel said, we then put this into event data, and this is also um, available also in the Scrollex format, um, so it can be reused. Um, so that's from a data site point of view. But then what happens if we don't capture it in data sites? So I also, next slide, please, um, still uh, one of Rachel's slides, which you've just seen, is that you can also do this from the Crossref side, and it's really important that you are focusing or the community is focusing on and particularly the publisher community putting in the data citations in a structured format and this is really really important that we can then reuse this in a machine readable format to make it um, useful in the context of a PID graph and making it available to surface those connections. Um, next slide um, and I think that's Oh, sorry, that's all I had. Um, I just wanted to say that um, the key message here is that the technology has been um, um, available and we wanna make sure that um, we as a community are now taking the steps to really implement this. And I think this is um, a shift as a community to, to work together and, and identify the pain points in making those changes um, to make sure that it's useful for all of us. Thanks very much. Thank you, Matthew. This is very exciting. That's an enormous amount of progress um, from both Crossref and Data Site, and it's, it's exciting to see that. Um, our, our next speaker helps us reorient on the publisher view, Varsha Kudier. Uh, she is the Data Curation Manager for Springer Nature, and I am quite excited about the work that she's going to share. Thanks, Shelley, and um, thanks, Howard, uh, and Shelley, both of you, for uh, inviting me to speak today. Okay, could we have the next slide, please? Um, so I wanted to start by just talking about um, uh, work that we do at Springer Nature in relation to what we do for researchers. Obviously, researchers are authors, and they are, they are our customer base. They are the people we're, we're here to help. Um, so for the last few years, we have carried out in collaboration with Digital Science, uh, the State of Open Data Survey. And so I just picked out a couple of the questions that we asked in 2020. Um, what circumstances would motivate you to share your data? What problems, concerns, if any, do you have with sharing your data sets? And you can see here um, the responses that we got. Um, key things for us is think about what, um, what, how we can help researchers with the issues that they have and how we can help motivate them, how we can continue with the motivations that they have. So you can see the highest thing that came up in terms of motivation was full data citation and the work that Rachel and Matt have just described is really helpful in helping in a, deliver that uh, vision that researchers have of data citation for their work. Um, they want to increase the impact and visibility of their research. 
and they want to have co-authorship on papers and so on. You can read through and um, all of this data is available openly at Figshare um, at the DOI shown on my slide. If we go, sorry, <laughs> just yeah, thank you. Um, so if we then look at the problems and concerns, what concerns do researchers have? And they have concerns about misuse of their data. They're worried about uh, sensitive information and uh, whether there's permissions required. And the converse part of the full data citation motivation is not receiving appropriate credit acknowledgement. And then we see a few um, entries under things that they're unsure about. They're not sure about copyright licensing. They're not sure about permissions, um, etc. So, okay, next slide, please. So what do we do as researchers, uh, as a, a publishing house, sorry. So the first thing that we, we are a publishing house, we can share uh, types of data uh, papers. So we have data papers. Uh, there's two main journals um, that currently uh, facilitate the sharing of uh, data papers. And the first one is scientific data. Uh, the data paper format at scientific data is called the data descriptor. And the focus at scientific data is data peer review. It's on sound science and the emphasis is on enabling data reuse. At BMC Research Notes, the data paper format is called the data note. It's intended as a short format. Again, it's a sound science journal, and there the emphasis is on data sharing. So these are two options that we have at Springer Nature for researchers to gain credit for sharing their data. Next slide, please. Um, and the other thing that we do is we're thinking about how to uh, bring data sharing into journals that aren't focused on data. So obviously the two journals I just uh, showed an example of are very much focused on, on data and the editors and the editorial assistants all know what to do with data sets. But how can we bring that good uh, data sharing practice to other journals? So one of the things that we've done is we've created a, a series of policy types and I can ask you just to forward the animation just one because actually um, what the data types and what the policy types are and what they actually mean it's you can see all of the detail on our um, website and if you're interested but actually the key things to, to know about these policy types is that we're asking authors or encouraging authors to cite and reference data sets both newly generated data but also data that they've used um, from existing sources all of the policy types you have at Springer Nature express a preference for sharing data via repository rather than in um, supplemental information. All of the policy types allow the citation of public data sets in the reference lists, um, as we've just heard, so important for um, data site and uh, Crossref to be able to pick these up and then make use of that information. Um, and we also provide um, a, a publisher help desk. So we have a help desk for our editors um, in order to help the editors to give the appropriate guidance to their authors. Next slide, please. So what, what kinds of things, what does it look like in a, in a manuscript? Um, so we're facilitating data availability statements. We're enabling and more importantly, encouraging authors to provide descriptive and informative statements in their articles. Key things that we ask them to cover, what data are available and how those data can be accessed. So I've got two examples here. One is a data records section from the journal Scientific Data. And you can see here, there's three data records that have been described and there's clear information about where to go to access those data. If there's anything else that the author thought was important for you as the reader to know about that data set. Um, the example on um, the other side of the slide is a data availability statement from a different journal. And again, this is a more kind of text textual description, if you like, um, but it says it covers similar uh, points, um, it explains which data are available, where they're available from, and again, any additional information that the author needs, uh, the reader might need in order to understand what data are available and how to access those data. So you can see here, there's some parts of this data set that actually is only available on request. And um, there's a reason given as to why those data are only available on request. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to say much about this slide, just to say that uh, we are part of the Scholix initiative that you just heard uh, both uh, Matt and Rachel talk about. And uh, we're really pleased to be able to contribute to all of these um, upcoming data citation initiatives and the, the growing infrastructure that's being built around data citations. Next slide, please. 
So um, the other thing that we're doing is we're encouraging authors to use data sharing standards that already exist. So one of the important things that we do is we encourage our authors to use discipline specific repositories uh, as opposed to generalist repositories where these are available and we give very clear guidance on our repositories pages to this. We also support um, that uh, induced research community endorsed norms so for example in the genetics and genomics community uh, the norm is for sequence data to be shared in particular repositories and so we back that uh, community by making authors that come to us with those types of data are then sharing those data to those particular repositories prior to the manuscript being published. Uh, I put my hand up and say we don't get this right 100% but we are definitely moving towards trying to uh, make sure this happens more and more and there's fewer and fewer of these mandated types of data are not actually available when the manuscript is published. The other part of what we do is we're backing uh, community initiati initiated data sharing projects and initiatives. So uh, the example here would be the Enabling Fair Data project, uh, which Shelley knows all about. And we're really pleased to be able to move towards um, our journals supporting those initiatives wherever we can. Next slide, please. Um, as I said, Earlier, we have a help desk for um, our editors. We also uh, run a help desk which uh, researchers, uh, whether they're publishing with us or not, are very welcome to uh, email for help. And um, this, uh, is, this uh, service is provided by the Spring Nature Author Services team, but is supported by the research data team. And via the help desk, researchers can have access to expertise in data curation and management, archiving, uh, licensing, etc. And um, in this way, uh, research, we're ha helping the research community to have their questions answered on research data, hopefully enabling them to then make their data openly available. Next slide, please. Um, another part of what we're doing, we, you know, thinking about some of the concerns that were raised in terms of thinking about why people are hesitant to share their data. Um, we run a series of training workshops on research data and the really important um, thing that these do is as well as giving uh, researchers information about what they need to know in order to share their data well it also provides them that forum to discuss any concerns that they have so there's lots of space within that training workshop for people to ask questions about their specific use case next slide please <coughs> excuse me we also have um, a research data support service and this is an optional service providing for data curation for uh, researchers and um, data sets. Just excuse me one minute. So researchers are able to submit their data files in a secure way. They know that those data files are not going to be made public. We look at the data files, we give, um, provide um, advice and guidance on what researchers can do to improve the way that the data are presented. And then we give them guidance and advice on how they can link that uh, data set to their final published uh, paper and vice versa. The kinds of things that we see coming out from, uh, from the curation service is uh, integrity of research and policy compliance. An example would be the removal of sensitive data. We might uh, give them advice on correcting um, errors um, and also we give them advice on improving their data fairness. Next slide, please. Marcia, just a few more seconds. Oh, okay, sure. <coughs> I think I'm almost done. Um, so the other, um, what we do, this is an example, a worked example of what we see from RDS. So the original data availability, availability statement just said the data are available from GEO, but when our curators then looked at that manuscript, they found all of these additional data sets that had actually been mentioned in the, in the methods of the manuscript. And you can see we ended up with a very rich uh, data availability statement after curation, really specifying which data sets were available and from where, and um, uh, which actually could only be available on request. I think that's my final slide, Shelley. Sorry for going over. Thank you so much. No, no, that's fantastic. And, and the fact that your final slide demonstrated the difference between um, a rather weak 
data availability statement and a strong one is a perfect cue to bring in Tim Vines, who is our project lead for Data Seer. Um, and I think you'll all find his product really interesting in support of this last issue that Barsha showed. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much. Yeah, so um, in a nutshell, what I'm going to be talking about is how we go from the general advice that authors are given, you need to share your data, you need to do this, that and the other, and translating that, crossing that implementation gap and telling them exactly what they need to do with that document they have in front of them right now. Um, but to give a little background, uh, next slide please. Um, this is why, I mean, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this, but this is one thing that I keep coming back to um, is why this is so important. Uh, this is from the Pew Research Center survey in 2019. And it really shows that the, when the American public gauge things that would influence their faith in scientific findings, open public access to data is way up there. Next slide, please. And uh, to show how strong this effect is, 57% of them said they would trust the article more, the scientific findings more if they knew the data were available. And that's not because they're gonna go and dig into it and try and reproduce the results, but it's because they think that some, they know that somebody can, and they, someone can go and verify that. Next slide, please. And this also applies to what we see with researchers themselves. Uh, this is a study out of the Ocean Open Science Foundation showing that when researchers are asked about the trustworthiness of preprints, which don't have the trappings of a journal label on them or a peer review label on them, they trust the, thing, the, the preprints that have open science available to them. That is the materials, the data and the scripts. So next slide. The, the thing we need to do here is work out how we can um, promote open research data and what's the mechanism we can use because it's going to give us this huge positive benefit with both public and the science community. Next slide please. Um, and so we need to do two things. First we need to lead authors through the data sharing process as Varsha was just saying when you ask authors what's hard about data sharing, they have a huge long list. They say, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to put it. I'm worried about copyright. I'm worried about people taking my data. And so what we need to do is get right in there with them, with their document and say, okay, this data set needs to go on here. You don't need to worry about copyright in this instance. You don't need to worry about privacy and, and work them, walk them through the process of sharing their data. And then the next step is to certify what they've done once you've established what the expectations are for the document, then you need to go back and work out, you need to work out whether they've done the things you wanted them to do. Humans can do this. Um, the Spring and Nature data curation team is an absolute excellent example of this and they help people share their data all the time. But the problem is that um, we've got two and a half million or so articles out there and we need to find a way of working with them all. Next slide, please. And this is where we need AI to come in because AI is able to do things that uh, at massive scale, much bigger scale than we can do with human curation. Next slide, please. And so this is where Dataseer comes in. We're using artificial intelligence to help promote data sharing. And uh, sort of echoing the previous slide, to assess open data, we need two bits of information. Which slides, which data sets are associated with this article and which of those data sets have been shared. And we can assess this with natural language processing. So next slide. Um, this is a sentence describing data collection. And uh, you can see here that there are three data sets being described here, the quantification of viral RNA, infectious virus titers, and lung histopathology. And there's also keywords that really tell us that something's happening, collected for quantification is the, uh, is the key phrasing that's com coming up here. Next slide, please. There's also very stereotypical phrasing authors use when they are getting from getting data from an existing database and um, drawn randomly drawn from the public use data of this public database. And next slide, please. There's also very stereotypical language they use when they're sharing data. Wing images generated by the study are available through Data Dryad. And natural language processing, just as humans reading it, are able, is able to spot that this sort of characteristic language and surface that some the authors have either created a new data set, they've reused an existing data set, or they've shared their own data. And we can pick those instances out of the article. So next slide, please. And then once we've done that, we need to give the authors 
a detailed report on what they should be doing. So next slide. Uh, here is a data share, data share sharing report. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the top part there was the metadata of that article. And down below, here's uh, the individual advice for the debate data sets that we detected in this particular article. So um, first is a, the uh, plasma that they collected. Um, the second is flow cytometry data that they collected. And neither of those were shared in the particular article we are analyzing here. Um, and so we flagged to them, you need to get on and share this data. And then next slide, please. We don't just leave it like that. We give them sharing guidelines. This is what you need to do for this particular data type. So for flow cytometry data, um, they need to keep the original FCS files. And they also need to provide a file showing how they decided on the gating. And then we recommend the most suitable repositories because as Varsha showed, the authors really don't know where to put their data either. And this is not a list of all the repositories that take flow cytometry data. This list is actually context specific. What we've done um, with our tool is called the repo recommender. It, we have used the context of the article that is where the authors, the author's institution, the author's funder, the journal they've submitted it to, the subject area, the species being investigated um, and the type of data to narrow down the choices of the repositories and we present them here in an ordered list. And so either of these two is the most suitable repository for this data. Next slide, please. And so here's an approximate workflow of what we do. The authors send the article to Dataseer, we check it with the AI and then a curator makes sure that um, the, the AI hasn't made any glaring mistakes and we tidy it up and we send that as a report to the author. The authors share more data sets. Um, typically when we're doing the first pass, the, the data are not being shared. And so we need to say, okay, you need to go and share all these. And then they send us a new version where hopefully they've shared as much of the data as they can. And then we provide a data set certificate, which looks like, next slide, please. This, um, and so there's, um, uh, but it's a bit small, but the top part uh, shows that there's a PID for this certificate. It's available online, openly accessible, um, and it's all machine readable as well. And the um, JSON, uh, the, the publication of the certificate leads to a package of event data being sent to data site, showing um, up surfacing the linkage between the availability, the, the data set that's been put on a repository and the individual article that has shared this data. And we also have data information on the, the very sentence where that data set was described in the, in the article. Next slide, please. Um, so this demonstrates, this certificate demonstrates compliance with open data policies. It shows that all the shareable data sets are public and the others where it can't be shared for privacy reasons, perhaps we give an act, they have to give a stated access procedure. And it serves as a public record of article data set linkage, a permanent public record of how this article and this data set are linked. And like I just said, event data were passed across to Apple data site, and we intend to become a Scolix hub in due course because we hope to be making many, many of these linkage documents. Next slide, please. Another thing we can do with this um, technology is we can audit data sharing across a whole corpus of documents. That is um, previously published articles, at preprints, we can also look at a corpus of technical documents because in the grey literature people use very similar phrasing to uh, regular articles and we can examine those for data sets. Um, so an example of this process, we took 100 articles from PLOS One, 50 published in 2015 and 50 published in 2020, and all of these studies were funded by the same agency. So if we go to the next slide, for 2015 we found 252 data sets in, um, in these articles in 2020, we found 160. The percent that were not shared was high in both cases, 76% in 2015, 61% in 2020. Um, if we move, go to the next slide, please. If we zoom in on the individual article level, in 2015, you can see that most articles did not share any of their data. Uh, but by 2020, next slide, please, the proportion that shared all of their data has actually gone up quite a long way. And the proportion shared none has gone down. And so this probably represents a cumulative impact of PLOS One's much stricter data sharing policy that had only just come in in 2015, um, plus uh, the policies of the, of the funder themselves. Next slide, please. So 
So this is where we're at now. Um, we have pilots going with several publishers and preprint servers. Um, we will publish the data sharing report for this PLOS One corpus and get into the various the sharing patterns with the different data types we've detected. And we're also working on other use cases, integrating with service providers and other stakeholders so that we can um, surface as much data as possible. And uh, next slide, please. Thanks very much. Tim, that's fantastic. Um, you know, each of our speakers has, has come at this challenge of uh, data sharing and data citation from the various levels uh, uh, all the way from you know publication to how we're going to track that in the downstream services and the linkages. But if I could ask the speakers a question, um, one thing, uh, uh, and knowing that our next panel um, uh, is, is keen on, on policy and funding areas that might need help, um, I'd like to queue up a question for you. So, so our researchers are primarily motivated on getting a paper published. Um, there, uh, we're slowly evolving. It's just starting with valuing uh, an important data set, um, any, the, data, the data that supports research as its own research product. So this is why we're running into challenges at publication because the researchers may not even realize they had to share that data in a way that's uh, aligning with the journal guidelines, with the funder guidelines. Um, uh, and I'm wondering if our speakers could, based on your experience and conversations, talk about, uh, you know, how do we get that citation to start with? And, you know, Tim's product is one fantastic way to do that. Um, but, you know, the, we have a vast world and there's many solutions and we should use them all. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you could think that through and perhaps share your thoughts. Uh, is that for all of us or me in particular? It, it, it is. It is for all of you. Um, uh, Tim, do you want to start? Someone else, uh, someone else go first because I'm quite hoarse. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Varsha, could, could you go ahead and go first? Because I know you've been talking to go quite a lot. Sure. Yeah, so um, I think we just, we need to, we need to support authors, researchers at the point that they're publishing their, their papers. Um, we need to uh, for them to cite articles is, is second nature. I mean, people don't even think twice about that. And we need to try and get them to think about data in exactly the same way. Um, I think all four of us, we've all talked about some of the pieces of that. And between us all, I think we have a solution there. We, you know, we need to make sure that the infrastructure is there so they can see when they do take the trouble to cite their data, they get credit for it via all of the linking and uh, the PID graph and everything. Um, we need to help them to do that. So we need to provide them guidance and help. So help desk or training. Um, and, you know, as, as Tim says, it's a very, it's not a very scalable process to take each author through each manuscript. So we also need solutions like Tim's um, building uh, to make it scalable. Yep, yep, exactly. You you left out, um, and, and I, I know you didn't do this on purpose because I didn't give you a lot of time to think about this, but um, the, you know, as the author, uh, as, as the researchers thinking about their project, we have these concepts of the data management plan um, that really don't connect to publication. Like they're like, it's just to get the grant for and not even all funders require it. I, I wonder if the community could, our panelists today could talk about, you know, getting the mindset. Um, uh, for instance, um, Matthew, you talked about being able to provide a funder based on a particular funding ID all of the different research products that are available. That's really valuable to a funder. Chorus does that um, as their primary product. And um, you know, what does that mean for a researcher to realize their funder cares, their publisher is helping, and there's these behind the scenes infrastructures? Yeah, I think it's sort of bringing everything together. And um, one thing, interestingly, in our schema 4.4, which will be released in the next couple of weeks, that brings in a resource type general outputs management plan. And we've done some work with DMP tool and actually visualizations in Jupyter notebooks on the PID graph that visualizes all of these connections. But I think it's really important that one that we can put in policy in place, but we also need to show the value and how that helps the researcher in terms of discoverability and visibility of their research and their contributions 
to all of the research that they do, not just the publication, but the data sets, the software, the protocols, putting together the outputs management plan. And I'm using outputs management plan because that's also what we've decided to do because that includes, we've started to see some things like software management plans and data management plans and working with the DMP tool, we decided outputs management plan is something that really is inclusive. And so I think bringing those together and then working with um, making sure that funders are working with the repositories that they run, but also advocating for the policies to be involved in initiatives like Make Data Count. So we're surfacing also the impact and the reuse of that data and those type of things um, that are available in the infrastructure. And then also, sorry, I know I'm sort of on a soapbox here, but also making sure that all of these things that we do, that we're doing it out in the open and making it available for reuse. And so when we talk about infrastructure that we're not building silos and sort of segmented systems that we make it available for reuse and different use cases um, throughout the ecosystem. Yeah, I appreciate that because um, the, the infrastructure that Rachel and Matthew represent is completely dependent on what is being sent to them. Um, so having the publishers in sync with the services, in sync with the funders is really important. Tim, did you have a thought? Sorry, I thought it's... Um, um, no, I think the answer answers very well. I mean, the only thing I'd add is that um, the, the upstream component of actually getting, of telling authors right there, like, okay, you've talked about um, using a data set, but you've only just put the acronym of the of the, the database that you've used. You've not put a DOI, you've not put in a link to it, you've not even put the full name. And that's very, very challenging for anybody to spot. Fortunately, when if they use the stereotypical we downloaded data from, then data is going to be able to surface that and prompt them, okay, you need to do a much better job with this data, data citation here. You need to put the DOI, you need to say exactly which data you used, and so on. Um, and I think that will help with a lot of the downstream problems of data citation, just even prompting people to do it in the first place. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with you and I, I appreciate that characterization. Let, let me bring up a, a, an item that um, we've touched on a little bit and that is, you know, we're talking pretty much here about one particular persistent identifier um, and we know there's others and we know data is represented by other persistent identifiers. Um, that are uh, important to those communities. And I, I as you are, um, and I'm thinking of Rachel, I'm thinking of Matthew, as you're thinking about evolving services for beyond a DOI or, or at least somehow collaborating, can, can, you, can you talk to what it means, um, maybe the challenges, maybe, maybe what would be helpful for you um, as, as the rest of us are talking to our researchers on, um, you know, there's ARCs, there's RRIDs, there's um, uh, software heritage IDs, there's a number of others that don't get the same kind of treatment and that's really challenging. <clears throat> yeah, so, and one of the questions that did come up was about, um, one of the questions that came up was about, as you said, for um, accession numbers, for example, yeah. and we've had questions about ARCs as well. Um, and I think, you know, from the Crossref side, it's always easy. It, we, we started the building event data and the, the sort of the, the connections to data sites through that using the DOI because it's, it's kind of our bread and butter for a um, lack of a term. But the relationship schema that we support supports the, um, supports, um, the establishment of relationships between the article and then other um, other identifiers like ARC succession numbers, e even URIs as well, because as you said, to to insist that uh, you know a data set has to have a it, it has to have a DOI is um, is potentially limiting. And I think that in the in the Crossref schema in general, and I could broaden this out to things like identifiers for authors, for example, um, we or for organizations like, for example, Roar, we, we don't, we wanna make sure that we're able to support different types of identifiers that the, the relevant communities are using. As you know, we're sort of involved in conversations about software citation as well. And um, so I think that, as you said, a, a closed approach isn't gonna 
properly support the researchers who need to be able to share that information. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and I'm you know, not wanting to ignore the Q&A as well. So let me take a quick look over there. Um, we do have journal submission systems. Um, and I, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if any of our, our panelists are aware of um, how, uh, for instance, uh, EJ Press is, is identified here, but there are others helping with proper metadata, I'm assuming for, for, for data sets. Um, I, I, I do know EJ Press is working with Dryad uh, myself, but it does, is anyone else aware of these uh, different efforts? I know that because we, um, again, at Crossroad, we have the sort of service providers working group and in that, so we've been talking to editorial manager who I think are getting Aries editorial manager who are getting close with this. And I know that STM um, and obviously different repositories as well have been in touch. So there is movement within sub submission systems. And I think, again, this is just another point, like when we're prompting authors upon submission, you know, researchers, oh, could you provide your ORCID ID? It just acts as a little prompt to say, oh, this is something that I could be thinking about. So I think just building it into kind of standard workflows is really helpful. Perfect. Also, Perfect. also encouraging the members, I think, you know, Crossref had their participation reports and sort of metadata completeness comes into that and data site are doing something similar in metadata completeness dashboards to encourage our members, regardless of the system that they use to really try and encourage them to sort of fulfill some of these metadata fields and make sure that um, the metadata is useful to everyone. Yeah, and I, and I would I would bang that drum about complete and accurate and a number of quality dimensions having to do with metadata, and that is a challenge for for all of us. Um, there's a there's one one question. Um, uh, with, there's a link to the open metadata of scholarly publications. I I'm not uh, I've not clicked on this link to 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 make sure that I know exactly what it is. But it, if any of our panelists is aware of that work. Um, uh, uh, can, uh, cross refer data site um, looks like you are on the board. Um, can you guys speak to that at all? Sorry, didn't mean to catch you, but <laughs> quick, click the link. No, no totally. I, I'd seen it in the Q and A, and it said the 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 metadata that's registered with Crossref is it's openly available. We just released like an open. Um, data file goodness I think that was earlier this week time's a bit of a mystery at the moment um, but so the the information that we the publishers register and any members funders who are registering grants etc that's made available via open APIs we're going to do an annual um, data dump and I think um, you said there are there is still for example reference metadata that some publishers don't yet make open but a lot are transitioning to make that open um openly available as well and i think for the um for the infrastructure that matt and i showed for event data um that's all based on openly available infrastructure so so things like that need open metadata to make them happen all right well thank yeah. you i we are we're, i'm sorry go ahead matt well, i was just going to briefly say uh the Data side metadata data file is uh, CC0, um, so short comment. Um. Thank you, that's fantastic. And thank you all for your talks today. I really appreciate it. We're gonna hit noon here in just a second, which is the end of this particular section. Um, if anyone has questions for our panelists um, as time goes by, please put them in the Q&A. Um, I know there's lots to ask them. I know we didn't hit all the questions. Um, but it's, it's really good to see this progress. Um, things are evolving and um, it's very exciting. Thank you all. Thank Thanks, you, Shelley, Shelley and session Thanks, one. Shelley. Folks. That was great. Excellent. All right. Um, welcome back everyone from the break. We're up for session two now. So I'm your moderator and this session is going to be on the challenges and progress with data as a key asset for funders in academia. As you can see here, we've got five illustrious speakers in front of us who are going to uh, tell their views. And it, it's, it's across the EU funding landscape, the US funding landscape, as well as institutions. And then, as, and then I think, Julia, you're gonna bring that all together to, to show us how this could all be integrated and work. So I'm gonna ask uh, the speakers uh, who are not speaking immediately, um, just to turn your videos off. And I'll please allow me to introduce Costas Rapanas, the Policy Officer at the Open Science Unit, uh, the Director of General Research and Innovation in the, at the European Commission.
Costas, over to you. Thank you very much, Howard uh, and Shelley, for this invitation. Uh, very glad to be here. Uh, we just had a great session, and I'm going to talk about a uh, few things that were already mentioned and also what's happening at the European Commission in relation to open science. And uh, also, my colleague, uh, Carlos Casaran, is, is here in the audience. Uh, so we'll be happy to take any questions at the end. So next slide, please. Right, so at the European Commission, we give a lot of emphasis, uh, as you uh, probably some of you know, at, uh, open, at the open science policies. And uh, we believe that uh, uh, sharing knowledge and tools as early as possible uh, between researchers and between disciplines uh, helps a lot in um, quality, efficiency, and creativity of research and increases the trust by society in science, which uh, Tim already uh, mentioned in his um, survey in the previous session. And uh, we also have several other benefits like uh, trying to tackle the reproducibility crisis. Uh, we are currently in a pandemic and we need to respond fast uh, and uh, open science helps uh, with that as well. Uh, also open science helps to reduce inequalities. And we had a study two years ago that uh, we saw how uh, not having fair data, uh, data that are findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable can have serious uh, opportunity losses uh, for, for several countries. And um, if we can go to the next slide, uh, I would like to tell you uh, a bit about uh, what is uh, likely to come in the Horizon Europe, our next framework uh, program at the European Commission. You see here in this timeline that uh, we started from a simple open access policy in 2008 uh, as a pilot and slowly adding several elements uh, such as open data, uh, data management plans. And now we're likely to see even more stringent uh, requirements for research data management uh, in, in um, line with fair principles, but also uh, citizen engagement. And we want all these different open science practices to be present at the evaluation of proposals uh, in the grant agreement as uh, requirements but also at the reporting of uh, grantees at the end of, of the project. So if we can go to the next one. Uh, it's quite important for us to stress uh, this difference between fair and open, because one doesn't mean uh, that you need the other, meaning that you can have uh, data that are for valid reasons, uh, either accessible under restriction, uh, restrictions or uh, under a data access committee or, or for uh, other reasons. So we want the data to be as open as possible and as close as necessary. But uh, ideally we would like uh, the majority of uh, all the data to be uh, fair. And uh, again, this is something that uh, we, we feel that there is a bit of confusion, but indeed fair doesn't mean open. Uh, so the data management plan that uh, uh, rightly <laughs> Matthew in the previous uh, session called uh, perhaps output management plan. And this is something we are also considering as you will see also in the next slide um, will be, some, uh, no, no, <laughs> uh, still in the, in the previous, um, already a skeleton of this data management plan. Uh, we would like to see at the uh, evaluation stage of the proposal. And then uh, the successful grants will have to submit a data management plan, but we want this to be a living document. So to be, um, throughout the uh, life cycle of the project to be updated with uh, several milestones. And in this case, I would like to go back to, again, the previous session that uh, we want to uh, you know, change a bit the culture and not um, uh, for, for research, not having to wait for a publication to decide where I'm gonna submit the data. So this, uh, with the data management plan being a living document, we want this to be sort of uh, a thought that comes a lot before. And uh, we want data to be, of course, uh, in a repository or a database. And for this, we're developing uh, the sort of notion of trusted repositories with several characteristics, uh, like uh, having PIDs or written metadata in line with FAIR. And of course, we have also another uh, dimension, which is the European Open Science Cloud. And there are several, several repositories and databases will be federated under uh, the EOS. So there might be an additional requirement. And we recommend and require uh, openness uh, with licenses uh, such as Creative Commons uh, licenses or 
uh, equivalent. And next, please. Uh, here is what I, I meant before about the outputs and the other outputs, because it, it's quite important to, to move uh, a bit away from this notion of uh, sort of only uh, focusing on publications and now increasingly on, on data sets, but we want to see other uh, research outputs that are equally important and can be reused, such as uh, software algorithms, uh, protocols, workflows, uh, and even physical uh, outputs like uh, reagents, antibodies, or even hardware. So we want them to see proper them to see properly managed and described in the DMP, and there will be a very strong encouragement. And slowly, perhaps over the years of this framework program, we will see even more um, sort of. Uh, requirements on, on on these other outputs and uh, specifically we are looking at um, what fair means for these other digital objects such as uh, for example software or workflows and the next one uh, right so that, that that's a bit of a, <laughs> a play with words but uh, right we talk a lot about fair but how how can we make this uh, practice and how can we uh, provide assistance to researchers to, to sort of comply with our uh, requirements. Uh, so uh, I will talk about uh, three things in particular, uh, efforts that try to assess the fairness of, of data sets and uh, how can we have this evaluation of, of uh, how fair is, is the data set um, being compared across different methods. Uh, so let's go straight to the next slide which is um, relating to the Research Data Alliance uh, Working Group on the Fair Data Maturity model, of which, uh, of course, very happy that uh, Shelley Stoll is the co-chair. Uh, so this group produced uh, an, an RDA recommendation, which is a set of indicators. Uh, you can see them as a Lego building blocks of fairness and uh, that have different priorities and guidelines on how to use them. And um, this can be used both by uh, people that develop, uh, for example, evaluation methods, but also for, by researchers and scientists as self-assessment. And uh, this is something that uh, we believe funders and publishers can use to um, encourage uh, having more fair data. And in the next slide, um, uh, I, I would like to mention this initiative uh, called the Fairware Initiative. Uh, uh, backed by the Research on Research Institute uh, with a Wellcome Trust and several other funders across the world. And the European Commission is participating through our Fair is Fair uh, project, which is uh, under the EOSC umbrella of, of projects. And here we, we want to see if it's possible to have um, a software tool that's open source and can help to evaluate uh, data sets how fair are data sets, but also to sort of point researchers to the right direction on how to increase the fairness uh, of, of data sets. And uh, the collaboration between uh, uh, Rory and Fair is Fair uh, will ensure that building on from the uh, results of the RTA working group that I mentioned, uh, we are not reinventing the wheel, but we are building on solid foundations and, and we're progressing at the same level and uh, talking about fair is fair if we go to the next slide uh, you can see that fair is fair is uh, as a project also developing um, two different types of um, assessment one is called fuji which is uh, an effort to indeed uh, have automated assessment of data set and they have built on a subset of the indicators from the rda fair data maturity model working group uh, which is excellent and um, the FAIR AWARE, the second tool, is more for self-evaluation. It's more of a questionnaire type of tool that aims to help uh, researchers uh, understand what they have to do to increase uh, uh, the fairness of their data. And next, please. And then again, speaking about that and, and, and being in the middle of this uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, this is something that the European Commission, together with uh, Emboli BI, the European Bioinformatics Institute, and the Elixir Infrastructure and other partners, um, we developed uh, the European COVID-19 data platform. And this is an excellent example of uh, fair data in action against COVID-19. So this is uh, a, a pilot of the European Open Science Cloud and really shows 
how you can federate uh, data, bring together data from different sources, and make them available to researchers all around the world uh, to help uh, both the research against uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus, but also against the, the COVID-19 uh, disease. And uh, to the extent possible, uh, all these data are, are as open and as fair as possible. And uh, of course, we have seen through uh, several months, this was launched in, uh, last year in April, that uh, it's really appreciated by the research community. We have had uh, over uh, 3.6 million <laughs> web requests for data on this platform from 170 different uh, countries and territories, which is really uh, phenomenal, phenomenal uh, use. And in the next slide, you can just see this, this vision of how do we get from uh, data from patients, from either national um, infrastructures or from health uh, institutes uh, through uh, sort of spaces that, that are uh, protecting the data while, while they're being analyzed. Or uh, we have the Federated European Genome Phenome Archive, which is uh, specifically created for uh, sensitive data that can only be shared uh, under certain conditions. And then uh, on the right, you have the COVID-19 data portal, which is the visible part. So whatever can be shared openly can be uh, found through this platform. And this can be useful for uh, academia, for governments, uh, for the health sector, from the industry sector. And this is continuously uh, being developed and, and built upon with uh, several partners coming in and now moving to, to host also epidemiological, clinical data, and even social sciences and humanities data, which is um, really what we need to, to address this uh, global uh, pandemic. And the next one, please. Uh, this is just uh, you know getting towards the end and going back to the outputs um, of, of uh, research projects. Uh, so very computational workflows. I wanna mention here, just as an example of an excellent um, uh, European and American collaboration. So the Workflows RI is an initiative funded by the NSF, uh, but with uh, crucial help from, from Europe, from our project EOSC Life uh, uh, that created the Workflow Hub. And uh, this is a, a very good example of how other research outputs that so far perhaps were <laughs> uh, not in the limelight are, are proving to be really uh, important and especially for uh, COVID-19. So some of these workflows come from the, the platform that I mentioned before and can be found and shared and reused by others openly uh, in, in an effort to uh, accelerate uh, research. And uh, just the, the summary slide in the end, um, I think being aware of the time, I will not uh, repeat myself. Uh, I'm happy to take any question. And just, I will just go to the last point here that, uh, uh, sometimes this is uh, perhaps a bit uh, misunderstood, but the funders do not wish to uh, punish uh, grantees or, or beneficiaries, but we see FAIR being a journey and we want to help uh, researchers and scientists improve uh, the fairness of data. So because we, we believe that this at the end will um, help the reuse and, and building on top of what we have already funded. And it's, it's a benefit for everyone in the end. So thank you very much. And uh, I guess we'll leave the questions for, for the end. Thank you. Hi, folks. Um, my name is Martin Halbert. I'm the Science Advisor for Public Access at the National Science Foundation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in this brief presentation, I'm going to give you a little background on what has informed the NSF planning on public access, the current state of our efforts, and uh, planned next developments that we're undertaking right now. Next slide. So much of the uh, efforts at certainly at NSF and many U.S. federal agencies originated with a memorandum that was issued in 2013 by John P. Holdren of the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the US White House. Uh, the memorandum directed US agencies that issued more than $100 million in grant awards per year to develop public access programs, 
uh, and focus on sharing, especially peer reviewed publications and digital data. Next slide. Of course, there had been a, a great many efforts uh, leading up to the Holdren memo, many surrounding efforts that we're all aware of, of uh, uh, repositories in both academic and other scholarly institutions that have been repositing for a long time academic works of various kinds. Um, this memorandum, though, really solidified the stance in the, in the United States that publicly, that publicly funded research products should be made publicly accessible. Next slide. Uh, the NSF response was codified in a plan in 2015, the NSF 1552 plan under NSF Director Francis Cordova, uh, with uh, report leadership and development uh, by Amy Friedlander within the NSF. Uh, to pre very briefly review the points in this plan, let me go through them for a couple slides. Next slide. The plan laid out a overarching uh, direction whereby NSF could develop a, a mechanism and system for managing publications, data, and other research products that originated from NSF funding in a single management system, or rather a system that operated as a single management system, but was in turn comprised of various uh, virtual systems that I'll talk a little bit about in a moment. Um, it built on existing NSF policies and practices, leveraged resources in not only NSF, but other federal agencies, notably the Department of Energy that we work with very closely on this infrastructure and provided a, uh, a platform for innovation, data sharing, or, or rather article sharing, and broadened access to NSF funded research findings. Next slide. Um, our efforts are aimed currently at, you know, we had planned right along to explore with other agencies, not only DOE, but others, how to best improve uh, continued um, or continued improvements to public access and also to look at uh, opportunities for collaboration and public-private partnerships in this. The plan is coordinated within NSF by a group that I chair called the Public Access Working Group. And while the 1552 plan has guided us in the previous five years, we're now looking at an update this year to the plan uh, to sort of catch it up to where we are and where th as things have changed over the last five years. So look for some sort of an update to that uh, sometime in calendar 21, hopefully. Next slide. The current system that we now term NSF Public Access Repository 1.0 has a variety of functions and characteristics. It is really focused, uh, this, the first version of the system on articles and it enables researchers to enter their metadata for peer reviewed articles or publications or th themselves or to auto-populate the information by means of digital object identifiers through especially groups like Crossref. Um, the metadata that is recorded in the PAR system is also transmitted and synchronized with other NSF systems, such as our award search database. Uh, and that metadata can be searched in both systems. Researchers can deposit their articles in the form of PDFAs or directly download them through DOI locations. And note again that PAR is not a single system, but rather an infrastructure of various interacting uh, software subsystems within both NSF and the Department of Energy. Uh, next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, the plan always anticipated that we would be uh, coordinating our efforts with other US federal agencies. Uh, this has taken the form in the last year, especially through interagency alignment efforts of the, uh, this, this group that is, uh, has a long acronym, the National Science and Technology Council Subcommittee on Open Science, which has a number of different working groups that have done great work in the last year to identify best practices and uh, mechanisms whereby US federal agencies could coordinate their efforts in steps going forward. Next slide. Uh, this slide is slightly now dated. We've now completed this work. Um, we have in calendar 2020, we completed planning for PAR 2.0, 
Uh, and without going through all of the features in PAR 2.0, I can say that the, the major feature is that it will be uh, focused on accommodating data from research efforts and specifically data associated with uh, data sets that are reposited in trusted repositories out in the uh, different disciplinary and interdisciplinary communities. Um, we are planning currently to complete this work to enhance the system in this calendar year by the end of the year and make data set uh, repositing a optional feature in do sort of concomitant planning for, make, for the long term of making data sets uh, a required feature of, um, of federal awards from NSF. Next slide, please. So um, we are also engaging, you know, it, it's come to my attention that, you know, it's very important to uh, coordinate on these uh, features and think about the overall ecosystem uh, of data repositing in through efforts like this uh, forum and other discussions to coordinate efforts between public and private entities. Um, we are looking at and brainstorming mechanisms whereby we can enhance the capabilities of NSF researchers to uh, regularly uh, build in practices and mechanisms for repositing their data that is generated in the course of their efforts and other data products such as software and other kinds of things that come out of research. Um, this aligns well with the new NSF uh, Director Panchanathan's priorities of partnering with external organizations, and it will be a, a likely uh, step that we're going to be undertaking this year. Um, we will be uh, seeking in all cases to uh, maximize our adoption of emerging best practices in this work with other federal agencies and, and other uh, stakeholders in the community. Next slide, and I think that's my last slide. Thank you, Martin. Um, so we're going to take questions uh, at the end, as I've mentioned before. And so next up is Susan Gregorit, um, who's the Associate Director, Director for Data Science at the National Institutes of Health. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here and uh, to uh, be on this esteemed panel. Next slide, please. So sometimes, um, you know, certainly at NIH, when we think about making data fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, it feels like we've won, we've accomplished our goals, um, but I'm sure that everyone on this particular meeting will agree that um, really, it's not quite like that. Next slide, please. It's more like we have just started. Um, we're ready to now do some really excellent and wonderful data science activities and work and research because we have made our data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Next slide. And this might be um, a slide that has some animation on it. So um, what does it really mean for researchers um, to work across different uh, journals and different repositories to find, access, pull data together, um, data that can be made interoperable. It's really something more like the vision of finding an article here. It's the survival of retinal ganglion cells um, and their dependent activity. And what really makes this happen is to make the data um, across the journal articles searchable by basically making the metadata schema searchable. And, um, kudos to Crossref and DataCite for really pushing this forward, giving data those um, persistent unique identifiers, the PIDs, and then also to pull the data and the analysis tools um, that are linked to those data sets into, uh, from GitHub or other uh, places like Bioconductor into platforms like Galaxy, Jupyter Notebook, so that researchers can not only, um, go ahead and click, because I think there's one more animation. <laughs> um, researchers can not only find the data that are in our journals, but pull those together into a workspace and pull the relevant uh, tools uh, and programs and software that were made to analyze these data and then truly do um, some very impactful computational and data science activities. And there's a lot of work that's been going on to make this possible. And also um, uh, there's still more, much more work to, to be done as we will see. Um, next slide. So I just wanna mention really briefly the NIH data um, management 
and sharing policy that was issued just right before Halloween of this past year and comes into effect on January 25th of 2023. And some of the highlights of this uh, data management and sharing policy uh, will require NIH funded researchers to prospectively plan for how data uh, will be preserved and managed um, through the submission of a data management and sharing plan. And this is all researchers, if you're a center PI, an R01 PI, uh, the only exception of course is for training uh, uh, activities such as training centers and also infrastructure. So if you're applying for a grant for an MRI machine, for example, then you would not necessarily need to supply a data management sharing plan. This is also true for our internal intramural NIH researchers. These data management sharing plans should outline how your scientific data and any accompanying metadata will be managed and shared, taking into account any potential restrictions or limitations on the sharing of your data. Part of the plan is to provide a budget justification for uh, the work that you're doing. And you can, of course, request funding for data management and sharing. And so this plan will be part of your budget justification in the application. And although the um, review committee will see your data management and sharing plan, they will not uh, evaluate it um, and, and score it as such. So next slide. And you can, um, so go ahead and next slide. So some of the additional highlights of this data management and sharing plan will allow for cost for the curation, the management and the sharing of data through repositories. And so that you can actually uh, submit a budget for the associated cost for preparing the data and putting it into a repository and associate it with a publication. We strongly encourage researchers to use existing and established community-driven repositories or generalist repositories um, and to the extent possible when preserving and sharing their scientific data. So um, there's a website that you can link to on the BMIC website of NIH where you can see all of the NIH supported um, data uh, repositories. Next slide. Supporting data repositories and knowledge bases is a key component of our NIH strategic plan for data sharing. We have two funding opportunity announcements that are still active to support biomedical data repositories and biomedical knowledge bases. There are four main elements to these uh, requests for funding opportunities, the scientific impact of the repository or the knowledge base, including the impact not just to the community that it serves, but broadly speaking, the way that the repository or knowledge base will engage the community, including the journal community, the quality of data services and efficiency of operations, and finally, the governance. So the key component of these funding opportunities is that they are not uh, R01 grants, they are grants that are appropriate for data repositories and knowledge bases, and they focus on serving a community, preparing data, making it fair, and on the efficiency of the operations. So next slide. Part of the work that we are doing at NIH is to align with the overall global effort of the federal agencies to support data repositories. And this is in alignment with the OSTP desire characteristics for data repositories. So next, you have to click. Um, and the proposed characteristics really align to make data fair. And they started uh, from a group at NIH, um, the BMIC Coordination Committee. And we believe that these characteristics are general enough that they would support all data repositories um, and, and then including data repositories that share human data. Next. So, and then maybe one more. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and then the next slide will show these characteristics. So go ahead and click through. So I just wanna focus for a moment on these desired characteristics because this is something that we believe that NIH will be aligning to in the very near future. And that is to uh, assign unique and persistent identifiers to the data within the repositories, help plan for long-term sustainability of the data within the repositories, prepare uh, metadata that accompanies the data and also prepare metadata that is computable across repositories, provide mechanisms for curation and quality assurance, provide uh, easy access to data, uh, have uh, measured terms of use and reuse, 
provide guidance on um, how you measure metrics for success of the repository, use documented security um, and integrity processes, ensure confidentiality, uh, use common formats, tracking provenance of data, and then pri providing retention policies. So the next slide will show you um, some of the desired characteristics for data repositories that are sharing human data, including ensuring fidelity to the consent and governance of the data, including sovereignty of data when um, it's within tribal nations, compliance with data restricted restriction uses, ensuring participant privacy, planning for breaches and security and uh, misuse of data, providing for controls and audits, including downloads of data, addressing violations in terms of use of data, and allowing researchers uh, to request review processes. So when we think about data and data repositories and aligning to those desired characteristics, the other thing that we're thinking about is the life cycle of data and how we plan for data sustainability and the data resource or the data repository or knowledge-based life cycle. And these are two different things. And so I'll just focus on a moment on the data resource life cycle. It's an animation, so one more click. And that's really thinking about um, where data may be acquired, curated, aggregated, accessed, and analyzed, uh, and how we, how we support the entire life cycle of a repository. So the next slide is a slide provided by Dr. Kim Pruitt from NCBI. And it really thinks about um, just generally the data resource life cycle. Of course, there are resource data resources, the Protein Data Bank, for example, which may not have this bell-shaped curve but just generally thinking about how can we at NIH support data resources throughout their life cycle, including the starting of the resource through its growth and maturity model. And then um, in some cases, re data resources uh, change with the changing research landscape and then they could in fact decline. And so we wanna think about um, all of these stages and how we can support these to the most efficient way possible. So that there's an animation, so if you click on that. And some of the things that we have been thinking about, and many of you have participated in a few of our workshops um, on these two elements, trustworthy uh, data and data repositories, the best practices in data resource management, as we try to move data resources from introductory stage to the maturity stage, as well as the data metrics workshop, which really starts to help us think about the best practices um, in understanding data use and utility within a resource as it moves toward through the maturity phase and then um, as we start to measure if there is a decline and how we can address that. So these two workshops are really impactful and important. I mean, they've helped guide us as we're thinking about best practices within NIH. And the last slide is really just an outcome of one of the workshops that we held um, when we think about generalist repositories and the role that the community-driven repositories and the generalist repositories play in our data landscape and our data ecosystem. And so this is a snapshot um, provided from the workshop and delivered by Siad Chaudhary um, at Johns Hopkins University. When we think about the value line, um, when we think about the, the activities that are common across generalist repositories or perhaps all repositories, in core metadata and identifiers and authentication authorization. And when we think about where the repositories have unique value in dashboards, visualizations, analytics, potentially in linking, that, linking data together. And so as we move forward at NIH and implementing some of the recommendations from the workshop, we're paying close attention to how we can bring a community together to collaborate on shared and common goals and how we can instantiate um, work that are unique to each of our repositories that add value to them independently. And with that, I think this is my last slide. Yes, there's the workshop. <laughs> and thank you so much to Dr. Marianne Matone and Dr. Shelley Stahl for their excellent leadership in this activity and as they carry this forward um, through RDA and other community efforts. And the next slide um, is indeed my last slide. We've made a lot of progress, um, but we have a long ways to go. Well, we really do think about creating a fair data ecosystem that supports the very many different ways in which we conduct research at NIH and throughout the community. And with that, I 
think that it's, yes, that is the end. This is just a, a snapshot of my office, the Office of Data Science Strategy. I do not think there are additional slides. Fair and enough. with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Howard. Thank you, Susan, excellent presentation. So let's move on. So our next pr presenter is Sarah Nusser, who is uh, from Iowa State. And, but today she's actually here to talk about the work that she's doing with the AAU and the APLU. So over to you, Sarah. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I wanna give credit to the leads for the uh, Accelerating Public Research, uh, Public Access to Research Data, Toby Smith at AAU and Casey Rudd. Um, next slide, please. I uh, also wanna give a big shout out to NSF, which has funded two grants uh, to the APLU and the AAU and NIH for supplementing those grants. Next slide. Uh, so from a vantage point of a research in, uh, institution, public access to research data really has three drivers. Uh, the first is really accelerating discovery and innovation by making research products uh, public, uh, enabling them findings to be extended and new questions to be asked. Um, in addition, we're very much interested in ensuring that our processes have rigor and, uh, and that we can increase the public trust in science and scholarship. And this is really done through transparency and enabling our findings to be scrutinized. Uh, thirdly, uh, research is a highly regulated environment and it's uh, important for institutions to establish procedures in order to comply with any kind of regulation, in this case, being able to provide public access to research data. Next slide. Uh, but it's really the researcher we have to always keep in mind, um, whether we're part of an institution and having to navigate um, various elements of aligning uh, culture and priorities and, and services to researchers, or as we heard in the first part of this workshop, uh, external entities that are working on providing uh, support for researchers in, in order to share data. Next slide. Uh, and this has really been the focus of uh, AAU and APLU and the, what we finally call the APARD uh, project, Accelerating Public Access to Research Data, is really helping institutions change so that we can serve the researchers in sharing data. And uh, there's been a series of activities that have occurred over the last few years um, and I'm going to talk today about an institutional guide that's being developed as part of the project and is really being uh, contributed to by the 30 initial institutions that were part of the project uh, and the 45 new institutions that joined us about a year ago for the first national summit. Next slide. And the guide really seeks to uh, help address some of the many challenges that an institution is facing in terms of establishing a data sharing system. Um, it's not always clear who the leadership should be for these kinds of uh, initiatives because they have their tentacles in a lot of different offices, but it's important that somebody does take leadership. Uh, it, of course, we'll take resources, financial resources, as well, well as human resources, and, and who is going to be paying for the uh, new services and infrastructure needed. Uh, it's really important to have a research data policy that aligns with our current uh, sponsor regulations, but also just the broader uh, philosophy of open science. Um, we need our, uh, the recognition system for our uh, faculty to motivate them to be able to share data and reward them when they do. Um, there's a myriad of infrastructure components that need to be established by uh, an institution from services to hard inf infrastructure, such as repositories. And one thing that institutions face um, really anytime they try and do a campus-wide initiative is the disciplines vary a great deal and data sharing is, is no exception. Some are really uh, have very established practices and others are barely engaged in the need to share data. Uh, in addition, um, even though I am, I am really grateful for the harmonization that has occurred so far in federal data policies, they do still vary, uh, as well as other sponsors have their own um, uh, elements of compliance. And so it's really important for an institution to keep abreast of all of those. 
Um, and then uh, more recently, there's been a lot of talk about research security and protecting data and so on. It's actually really more of a continuum with scientific openness, and that's not very well un understood by researchers. Next slide. So the guide is really directed at university administers, administrators to help them assess where they are currently in implementing public access to research data and accelerate their progress. And it begins with this articulation of how providing public access to research products um, is in, aligned with the institution's mission. And then uh, really the body of the guide encompasses a series of recommendations um, that have various kinds of resources attached to them, including a description of what the recommendation is about, some initial actions that can be taken, and examples from other campuses as well as other resources. Next slide. And in um, constructing the content of, of the guide, um, we are borrowing from a model for a systematic institutional change that was put forward as part of this, the uh, uh, STEM undergraduate education, STEM education initiative. And so we need to think about the beginning parts of being able to establish a vision and the foundations, how we're going to plan, what strategies are we going to use, and how are we going to implement and monitor. But from a process perspective, this, this model really uh, hinges on the river metaphor where we're flowing along a process, but you hit eddies and you get caught up on things. And sometimes you have to return back to other parts of the process. Next slide. So from a content perspective, um, the vision or the foundation setting piece of the guide includes a call for the institution at the highest level to message the priority of public access to research data and their commitment to enabling it. In addition, there's a need to set an infrastructure with clear leadership and uh, uh, a structure in order to do the planning and implementation, as well as identifying resources. Uh, in addition to the foundation piece, there's the planning piece where you need to assess what you have on campus, what capabilities and assets, as well as what you still need to develop um, and how you envision the system for uh, providing support for public access to research data uh, to be designed, as well as an implementation plan. And then in the implementation phase, several things need to be developed, including a, a research data policy, a workflow that helps identify when you become aware that a data product needs to be uh, tracked uh, for uh, sharing down the road to being able to review that data uh, source and then being able to share it. Uh, as well as infrastructure um, training is really important to bring researchers up to speed and, and skills and their understanding of the sharing process as well as being able to message what is available to them and then the you know huge uh, challenge of changing the culture of reward in uh, for researchers next slide so i mentioned that there were other re you know there's a description for each uh, recommendation and then examples so this is uh, uh, an example that aligns with the setting the foundation in particular setting a structure uh, that would enable the planning and the implementation of uh, a public access system so this is taken from virginia tech and what they did is they established two groups in order to manage the project one is an advisory group that uh, represents the major stakeholders that show up in the system. The provost is the academic lead for the institution, the research office, the library, and information technology, which are the three that really have to work together to implement um, public access to research data. And then a committee that draws from those communities and others that need to be involved in establishing the uh the system um and in their case they wanted the committee to recommend policies as well as a plan next slide um so uh these kinds of resources there's also checklists and other kinds of links are really important because every institution is different and so they need to be able to evaluate a, a variety of information to understand where they are and what kinds of steps would help them make additional progress in addition, we realize that things are moving quickly. In fact, the, the first um, section of this workshop really demonstrated how 
new tools are coming on board very uh, rapidly. And so that we have the opportunity to update the guide, view it as a living resource as the landscape evolves. Uh, where we are in the process is the draft is underway and we expect to convene the 70 institutions that were part of uh, providing input to the, the guide in mid-March to review a pre-publication draft, sort of kicking off the beginning of, of a public release uh, process. Um, so uh, we are really looking forward to that and really being able to get some um, feedback on it and trying to, and being able to help institutions. And I think that's it for me, Howard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. That was excellent. So next up, we've got Julia Lane, who is the co-founder of the Coleridge Initiative. So Julia, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, for those of you who know me, I'm, I'm still at NYU as well, but um, my conflict of interest makes me um, uh, clearly delineate the differences between when I'm speaking as an NYU professor and as a college initiative individual. Um, so I'm going to come at this from a very different perspective. Um, this has been a tour de force of uh, information, at least for someone like me, who's not deeply embedded in this community, um, in terms of uh, understanding the processes and all the plumbing and infrastructure that has been developed. It's, it's amazing. Um, come a very long way from when uh, I was uh, more deeply involved when I was at NSF. Um, so I'm gonna come at this a little bit from my background as an economist. Um, so I tend to think about things as uh, creating incentives for people to um, uh, behave in the way in which you want them to behave. And so that's very much the um, way in which I'm gonna talk about this now. Um, so if you go to the next slide. Oh, and I should say uh, my conspirator in crime on this is Mike Stebbins, who was uh, very responsible for that Holdren memo. Um, next, so this is, um, uh, if you'd advance one more too. Um, so so he, here's where I'd, I'd like to start, is that um, I think this workshop and, and kind of the work you've all been doing is beautifully positioned for uh, the current environment and indeed the environment for the past three or four years. Um, and the reason for that is that um, there's been a massive move to uh, for federal agencies to um, leverage their data as a strategic asset. And I kind of got pulled into this about five years ago now um, when there was a commission on evidence-based policy making that was set up. Uh, and I was asked to set up a data infrastructure that would inform the decision-making of the commission. Uh, the recommendations of the, that commission, there were 22, and they got turned into this Foundations of Evidence-Based Policymaking Act. So if you are not aware of it, you might wanna go online and take a look. Um, there's uh, 10 or 11 of those recommendations were uh, passed into law. Uh, title two of the act has to do with open data. Title three of the act has to do with an extension of SIPSI, which is confidential data. Um, the balance of the recommendations are being evaluated by a FACA committee, a White House committee uh, out of OMB. Um, and I'm serving on that committee. If you wanna take a look at the, those deliberations, it's at ba.gov forward slash evidence. Now, um, that legislative mandate is partnered with uh, agency actions. Um, and if you go ahead and take a look at the federal data strategy, um, I don't know whether that'll persist into the next, into this administration, but um, it, they, there was a lot of excellent work that's been done. And, and I think OMB's, uh, the, the career civil servants are very much behind it. Um, and, and you'll see that um, the, uh, directives to the agencies are compliant with both the Foundations Act uh, as well as the um, Information Quality Act, which you might want to go and take a look at. And so agencies are being charged to um, uh, leverage their data as a strategic asset, you know, identify high value data needs, uh, publish data inventories and so on. So um, kind of the context for the work that you're doing 
is that both statistical and programmatic agencies, in fact, the 24 CFO agencies, um, are being charged with providing this information. Uh, part of the Foundations Act legislation was to set up chief data officers, chief evaluation officers, and statistical officers in each one of those 24 agencies, and they have CDO councils and evaluation officer councils. So there's a infrastructure around this. So you're in an environment in which um, federal agencies are being asked to publish data. Now we've been here before um, under the uh, Obama administration, as you probably remember, uh, there was a, an open data initiative and agencies were charged with publishing their data out on the web uh, as part of data.gov. For those of you who were involved with the federal system at that time, that did not go well. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, and the FACA committee has responded to kind of the criticisms of the Open Data Act by saying, you know, can we, before we go into the old, the whole process of saying, well, data is great, can we enunciate a description of what's the value of doing this? Not just say everyone has to do X, but how can we establish the value? And so this is the um, Federal Register Notice that the committee that I'm on um, uh, put out. Uh, when it comes to secure data, when, when it comes to high impact data, how do we measure that? How do we figure out what that looks like? How do we figure out what the high value data are? Um, and then it, when it's, uh, you're looking at confidential microdata, you know, data on human beings, I'm an economist, obviously, so in the social sciences, and obviously in the life sciences, a lot of data are, are confidential. Um, what's the value proposition to access to and use of data? And that conversation driven by value, if you go to the next slide, is uh, obviously going to be informed by the current administration's interest. And they've been very clear um, if you take a look at the um, uh, letter that uh, President Biden sent to um, uh, Eric Lander yesterday, uh, they, he talked about priorities, um, but the data priorities repeatedly have shown up as being health, racial injustice, climate change, and the economy. So how can we uh, identify out of the morass of data that's available, um, how can we um, describe what data sets are most valuable for answering these, uh, these priorities. Next slide. And what we learned from the open data um, efforts is simply forcing agencies or people to put data out results in what has been um, maybe in a not politically correct way. Uh, it creates a vomit of data and you have no idea what the value of the data are. It was badly designed, there was flawed execution, vague definitions, the agencies were super resistant because of all the uh, issues that uh, have been discussed just before. So um, putting processes in place without thinking about how to create the value to the user um, might end up, um, end up with us being in the same position that we were uh, uh, 12 years ago. So how can we figure out how to create a um, um, incentive-based system? So if we go to the next slide, we can look at the private sector. Um, when I want to figure out, for example, at Amazon, what book I want to know, what book I want to look at, um, if I want to um, work or figure out um, what information is available about Chinese restaurants or whatever near me would Yelp, uh, what I can do is I can type information in and it will recommend to me the most valuable uh, books or information that has value to me. Now, I don't have that with data. Um, what I have is I can type in information. I do get a list of information on, let's say, climate change, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't have underneath it a recommender engine that identifies the, um, the value to me or to the agency or whatever. Um, in fact, it's quite difficult to get information about uh, uh, data more generally. 
uh, because as the um, person who talked, Tim Vines, I think it was, when he was talking about data seer, and you've all talked about the difficulty about getting um, researchers to tell you what data sets they're using in their publications. So when I go into Google Scholar and type on something called climate change, it pulls up articles that have to do with climate change, but it doesn't tell me what data sets are in there. So um, next slide. So he, here's what we started to do. What we were interested in finding is, is there a way of automatically finding out what data sets are in publications? Again, very similar to what uh, the data seer people are doing. Um, but can we build a way of uh, indicating the value of those data sets which are hidden in plain sight, right? Because every empirical scientific article is going to say, here's the data set um, that I used. Um, so figuring out that from the, uh, from the rich context is going to provide us a signal of what data is. Now, how can I take that piece of information and by analogy, all the work that you guys have been doing to find and, and document data that are in, in a publication, how can I take that information and create uh, useful information to the data user, whether it's the researcher or whether it's to the, um, uh, the federal government or a state government that's use, using the information? And then how can I use that signal of value to incentivize people to provide better and better information, just like in Amazon.com, just like in Yelp, people contribute additional information because there's an incentive structure that's built in. So next slide. Um, so what we first of all did was we said, well, can we first find, uh, and we're working with, I should say, we're working with NOAA with uh, National, Science in, National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics at NSF and USDA. Um, and what we did was we ran a competition, we, um, uh, got people to uh, computer science teams, um, NLP teams to see, can you find the data sets in publications? We've been working with Chorus, which has uh, got its publishers uh, to provide access to their open access publications. And what we did was we applied uh, different sets of tools to find out which publications, which, which of a set of identified data sets were in a subset of publications. And so we were able to do that. So for example, um, NOAA identified these data sets that have to do with um, coastal inundation. And we went out and applied the machine learning tool to find out um, what publications are in there. But just listing publications isn't particularly interesting. So what we wanna do is we wanna figure out, okay, what's the value to um, the community of those publications. So if you take a look at the next slide, uh, one thing that you could do, and I'm gonna thank Shelley Stahl for this. Um, initially, I thought that what we could do is um, refer to this as kind of an alt metrics for data, but uh, people have allergic reactions to metrics. So think about just creating usage scores where a usage score is um, some measure of how much it has been used relative to the um, mission of a particular agency or relative to your interest um, that, that you've registered. And so Tyler Christensen, who's um, at NOAA, she was thinking about this and she said, well, you know, we have this uh, in the forestry service. They have measures of the value of, of the forests, the, the high conservation value of the forests, by looking at things like species diversity, how, uh, ecosystems, uh, community needs. And so next slide. Um, so she said, why don't we think about using that, those concepts, those scores to the conservation value of federal data? In other words, creating a, a value mechanism. Next slide. And so here's a concrete example where you can take that, um, that conservation value measure that's used for forests and take the information that is in 
a publication. So once you've got a data set to publication dyad and you've got 414 publications that cite a particular data set, you could uh, use that information. To, how often is that data set used in the publications? Um, how often is it combined with other data sets? And so what's that ecosystem? Um, how critical is it to that, that ecosystem? And then um, how much is it used relative to the importance of my, uh, relative to the mission of my agency, to the mission of the country, to the mission of the community? So thinking about the Biden, you know, uh, high priority areas, uh, you could imagine um, developing that just simply from the data set publication diets. So go to the next slide. Yep. You could imagine creating a data usage scorecard. So you could say, here are the topics that are generated from the publications. Here are the experts. Here's where we sit in the federal data system. Here are the other institutions. So that scorecard could be used as your incentive structure, both for agencies to identify what data sets have the highest usage and to researchers who are saying, wait a minute, I'm not reflected in this, I'm gonna provide more information. So it creates a market signal that both agencies and individual researchers and potentially publishers will respond to. And you've got the ecosystem set up to process the information once the incentive structures are in there. Next slide. So we could do it. It's a basic method here. All the moving pieces are there, put the incentive structure in and we'll be good to go. So how are we gonna do that? Um, great thing to do with Chorus is to expand that corpus. Next slide. Uh, Mike and I are working with Kaggle um, to host a competition built on a corpus to improve the machine learning algorithm so we can generate information from 80 million publications in principle. So you could get thousands of publications that are associated with particular data sets and then mine what the information that's in it. Next slide, and I'm gonna shut up in just a minute. The last point is we have a great incentive structure that is in place to, to, to do the work. A uh, lot of attention with the federal systems. Next slide. And uh, the way to respond to the very active advisory committee. So let's go ahead and I will be quiet now and um, get feedback from the entire panel. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Okay, if I can have all the panelists rejoin, that'd be great. So before beginning the Q&A as the panelists rejoin, I'd like to remind all our attendees that we're conducting a very short poll today. You could find the link to the poll in the chat window and we'd appreciate you completing the poll by the end of the forum. So thank you very much. So um, I thought all the, the talks were excellent. So thank you very much. Um, I'll kick off with a, with a question here. And by the way, uh, attendees uh, feel free to add questions into the Q&A box and we'll, we'll happily ask our panelists those questions. But we've heard a lot of talk about metadata today, right? We heard it in session one and a lot of you were talking about it in session two. So what do you think are the key metadata required to enable compliance with data policies? Anyone? Hi, this is Susan. Um, that's a great question. Um, and because it's such a diverse research audience, yeah. um, maybe I can approach it by telling you an example of what we're doing in COVID um, as an illust illustrative example, which is defining, and this is for clinical research particularly, common data elements that are, you that are shared across all of our different COVID studies um, that we can use as requirements that all studies will then agree to adhere to. And so those sort of minimal metadata standards perhaps is another way to put it, um, that all, all of the scientific initiatives uh, share in common things like um, uh, a DOI for the data or in, in NIH's cases, we're certainly interested in um, the grant information uh, Etc. So that might be a way to think about it. And then, you know, there are certainly going to be particular metadata for each community and each scientific area, but there must be commonality across all of us that we can all agree to share um, as common data 
are common meta metadata elements. Do we think, or does anyone on the panel think that perhaps the creator of, of the of the data and when they insert it, you know, into the repository, is that important as compared to say the author of the article? Yeah, personally for me, yes, I would certainly agree. And I think that having a discussion on that um, um, across our different communities would be uh, certainly very valuable. Totally agree with that. Um, I would ditto all of Susan's points. Um, and say that those that minimal meta metadata requirements for data set repositing is a key question for us to grapple with as a community. And um, and also, I really liked your point, Susan, that you know while there may be some minimal metadata elements that uh, cross all different types of, of data sets, there will undoubtedly be subject discipline specific uh, metadata either vocabularies, taxonomies, whatnot, that will be specific to individual uh, communities? I would say whatever the minimum is to get the maximum credit to the person who's providing it. Because if you don't set it up, um, I mean, I'm an NSFPI, because the uh, reporting requirements are so onerous, I basically do the minimum possible to get the report approved. But if you create a system whereby rather than forcing me to fill out lots of forms, you create a system where I automatically get credit, I'm going to be much more responsive to your request to metadata. Yes, and I would add one thing. Um, the, I, the research institution that was hosting the researcher when they created the data is another important element. Um, mm -hmm. they, they actually own the data and um, and it's part of how they get credit in their reputation. And I would point to the important role of Chorus for this because if Chorus can package that information and send it back to the agencies quickly and easily. And then that gives a feedback mechanism to the researcher, that's a high value proposition as well. So I'd look for the high value activities. Julia, you've raised a really good point um, that I think the, the agencies are very sensitive to of researcher burden and finding ways to uh, manage that, minimize it, because if uh, it becomes too onerous, it simply is not going to be manageable. Um, I'm curious if there are mechanisms to uh, enable researchers to delegate um, you know, all this form creation or metadata assignment to other uh, individuals within their research team or their institution, and then approve that uh, uh, submission as a way of sort of distributing that effort. Um, because I do, th I agree, I think there's an awful lot of burden on researchers in the reporting. No, I just, I don't think that's the way to do it because if someone else does it and you have no incentive to check it, you're just gonna push yes. Um, <laughs> so what I would do is Sam Klein has this great uh, line that people love to correct it when you get stuff wrong. So back when I was at NSF, I argued very strongly, a lot of this stuff's automated uh, and you've come a long way in the past 10, 10 years, right? So um, if you generate automatic information to the researcher and then they correct it so that they get credit rather than having to enter stuff and you see, you know, you, you have the immediate feedback, um, which they do in the private sector all the time. That's how um, all of these platforms get so much voluntary guidance. It's not because they can force people to comply, but because they've figured out how to create the right incentive structure. So correcting you if you're wrong, if you haven't given me enough credit, is the way to get people to do stuff, not, you know, creating lots of onerous forms to fill out. But I think here uh, we are talking about uh, perhaps a combination of uh, what can we automate and what can we ask in a manual way. So if we go back to the previous session, ideally we want a system like uh, you know Crossref and, and DataSite uh, collaborating on the events data uh, idea that can give us sort of the the, the connections and also perhaps the pit graph. Uh, but of course we need the, those those minimal, as you said, metadata yeah. to be there and then supplemented by community-specific uh, metadata where, where applicable. 
So if I can interject, so, uh, and thank you, by the way, Julia, for the plug before about Chorus, but we've been studying the data and been reporting on the data back to agencies for the last, you know, six years or so. And recently we've been also starting to incorporate the data from DataSite as well. But one of the things that we've seen is that um, because it's fairly new, there's, there's a lot of gaps when it comes to you know, data creators and especially um, about the institutions where, where that data set uh, was actually created. So that was a very good point, Sarah. But one of the things we saw over the years is that if an agency um, puts it into their guidelines about what people should be doing um, as far as, you know, when they record their metadata, please be sure to have the institution and the, the creator's name inserted into the metadata. That we've seen the improvement happen, right? Um, so when we started this back in 2013, it was minimal. And then as we saw the funder policies um, and plans uh, really start to take hold and they, and they modified them over the years, um, we saw the changes happen in the data. So, and, and you know, Costas, we haven't done as much in the EU, but equally, I would think that's just as important in the EU. Do, do you all think that that makes sense? I think anytime agencies can help researchers understand what it's what they are expecting from them, it's beneficial. So I I was once at a workshop several years ago where actually we were talking about the business, this was really early days, the business of how can agencies help promote researchers sharing data. And the response of a, a senior research officer in the room was um, require a, a note from the uh, senior research officer that they are going to comply with this. Now we've, we've got better mechanisms in now, but these, it's it's really hard to understate the importance of funders to researchers because they want to continue getting more funding. Yeah. So so, then, so you yeah. know I but I'm very much inspired by things like GitHub where people put their code up voluntarily and then they put how many followers they have on their CVs, right? So they contribute their code, they contribute the information, and then. Um, you see it when you sit on computer science panels, right? Because they will say, this is how much my code's been downloaded and used. This is um, as good as a publication to me. So that's why uh, the idea, I think, of having an altmetric score for the data that I produce, an altmetric score that says, I am on, in the top 10% of users of this data, uh, and so I'm an expert in this field, it, that... that creating that incentive mechanism should be at the core of it. So I think you've got to have the process plumbing that supports that, like GitHub does. But if the funding agencies and the data repositories think about putting the people's names in lights who have contributed the most to the data, who are kind of the data experts, that, that to me is the way to go. Think about the value proposition. I do think incentivization is central to this. And I'm curious, one of the things I'm very curious about is how do we give, I mean, are alt metrics a, a way of, will that give researchers as much credit as getting published in a top tier journal, for instance? Um, is that, or how do we, how do we raise that the prominence of, of those sorts of metrics to give them the incentives to, to do this sort of work, make it worth their time? So we have a couple of questions and some comments from the chat. So just gonna, I'll, I'll just add in the comments on the chat here so everyone can see them. So the first thing is we need researchers to provide and validate the metadata for maximum accuracy, which I think is an important feedback loop. Um, and then also, most if not all of the minim minimum metadata requirements should be easily pulled in an automated fashion from an interconnected system, which is similar to what Julie was saying, and certainly we heard a lot about that in session one. And therefore, the researcher burden is reduced by minimizing the manual input. But there are key things that, that require manual input. So looking at um, Mark Donahue's question that he just asked us, um, you know, how can publishers overcome the view that it's anathema to ask authors to provide additional information, even something as small as an ORCID? Any thoughts? Well, I, I think to the extent that we can really set this expected set of uh, metadata around uh, publications or data or whatever the research product is, 
it becomes regular practice. And, and um, you know, I really like Julia's ideas, but when you're looking at an entire campus, there are a whole lot of people who don't use GitHub who need to be engaged in this space. So there's, there's this um, process that we need to go through, especially institutions and disciplines need to go through to bring researchers up to speed on the kinds of uh, skills that they need. And then, you know, the system needs to define what it is that is going to be uh, a standard piece of a, a shared product. No, I didn't. I wasn't saying that researchers all needed to use GitHub. I was saying that the incentive structure that GitHub set up and that Stack Overflow set up has worked as a as a driver from the grassroots. So it's bottom up and people engaged, not top down. So uh, the question about how can publishers incentivize researchers to contribute information, you know, you have them at the moment crease when they submit a publication. You could imagine applying the machine learning model to the publication and saying, oh, I see that this is the data set. I think this is the data set that you used. Is that correct? Yes or no? Is it okay if we send it to a repository? Yes or no? So um, automating that process is, um, and just making it a, not having them type stuff in but then creating it and then say, oh, now that I've got this, I see that you're one of the top 10 people. I'm not going to, if you take a look at TripAdvisor and stuff like that, you're one of the top 10 people. These are how many people have cited you. These are how many people have done X. And that's how a lot of these platforms work. And so if the publishers set that up um, so that you get positive reinforcement as soon as you uh, respond, it, it, uh, People use it. People respond. Well, well, that that part I definitely would see and agree with Julia. But it it to me that begs the question of how the data gets reposited in a, a stable long term you know location in the first place for it to be referred to in that way um, and and providing the metadata in that 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 reposited location. I, I guess I, it would be great if it could be totally automated, but having seen a lot of that, uh, you know, those automation systems uh, over the years, it, it still seems like it, it needs some human oversight, I guess I, I, would, I would speculate. So you, you don't start at the end, you start at the beginning and you do a step at a time. And so when I built, um, sustainable national public infrastructures. You kind of start with some winning products with some immediate feedback that people want to engage with. It's not gonna be perfect. You go to, and then, then they start contributing additional stuff because then they say, oh, and, and we've had this with universities. I've had this with state and federal governments and so on. Then they'll say, okay, you've developed this little shiny toy for me. This is really cool, but co couldn't you do this? And you'd say, yes, if you pre, uh, provide additional data why and that's how you build a common data model and a common um, and, and kind of that ecosystem they're the ones who suggest the metadata and they're the ones who have the incentive to contribute it if we could make all that work that would be fantastic I bet we can I think we can you've got all the moving pieces you've got the federal government saying they want data and uh, we've got the potential to build shiny toys, you know, these, uh, these badges. So it's just a matter, it's like Steve Jobs, right? His genius was not building all the parts, it was putting them all together into a shiny toy. So let's do a Steve Jobs. <laughs> Sounds easy, Julia. Um, it so is, we, <laughs> just, it just takes determination. <laughs> we're almost out of time. Is there anything else that the, uh, that the panelists want to ask um, either of each other or perhaps of the audience. Well, let me just I commend you, Howard and uh, Shelley and everybody that had anything to do with putting this together. I, I would say at a, at a very basic level, we need more of these conversations. They are very timely. This is a unique 
period when a lot of this technology and practice has become mature enough to be uh, operationalized. And uh, we have great opportunity as, a, as an extended community to collaborate, collaborate on um, realizing these sorts of mechanisms that Julia is envisioning and, and creating them and making the uh, opportunities for open science in the community a lot better. Well, Martin, as, as though as though I had asked you to do it, which I didn't, um, thank you for the segue. Chorus will be doing more of these forums and certainly Chorus will be taking part in many other forums that others are doing as well. And so we do have an upcoming one that we're planning for the 23rd of April. It's still informative stages, but we uh, are, are thinking that it's going to be about is the transition to OA sustainable and equitable? Um, is is our, what are the new OA models and how do, how do people comply with those? because there are a lot of new OA, um, OA models that have come out in the last few months, and also uh, about infrastructure for compliance with funder mandates. And so that plays into a lot of what we've been talking about today. I'm sorry that um, we didn't get to handle all of the questions that we've had today, but if uh, we will keep the, uh, the session going for a little bit longer in case any of the panelists want to answer uh, the questions manually. And I, I want to thank all of the panel, panelists in both session one and session two. I think today's been a fantastic day. And if nothing else, we all got to know each other a bit better and what our programs are all doing. So thank you very much.